Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to iSelect's Deep Dive webinar series. My name is David Yoakum. I'm an associate on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to walk you through today's presentation and findings. For those who are new to these webinars, um, iSelect is an early stage venture capital firm in St. Louis, Missouri, focused primarily on early stage companies in healthcare and agriculture. At iSelect, we are privileged to live at the forefront of innovation, seeing emerging problems, solutions, and macro trends at their beginning before they make their way into popular culture. We use these, these deep dive presentations not only as a way for us to better engage with and understand new science and technology, but also to engage with the experts and entrepreneurs who are driving change and innovation in their respective fields. One such macro trend that we've been researching is the role of sugar and disease. Sugar has always played a role in human society. Once scarce, sugar was only attainable by the affluent and typically in small amounts. But as the scale of sugar production grew, its cost declined and became accessible to the general population. The cost of sugar dropped 180 times between the 13th and 19th centuries, and its consumption subsequently ballooned. Though sugar has been viewed as beneficial or healthy for the majority of human history, in fact, its dominance in the food system, particularly in the last 200 to 300 years, has played a critical role in the rise of major chronic disease epidemics, including type 2 diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Emerging research is showing that the overconsumption of refined sugar may also play a role in the development and progression of cancer and neurological diseases like Alzheimer's disease. For these reasons and many others, which we'll talk about in today's webinar, the role of sugar and disease is of increasing interest to Iceland. A few process comments. We are not soliciting investment or giving investment advice in any way whatsoever. This presentation is general industry research based on publicly available information. We've invited you to, these, to this webinar because your technologists, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, industry experts, early adopter customers, or sophisticated investors that are part of the ISLIC network. We value your thoughts, questions, comments, and insights into this topic and would greatly appreciate it if you actively engage during the presentation. Thank you in advance for your uh, attendance and your active participation. We ask that you put yourself on mute for the time being. However, we hope for this to be an engaging and interactive presentation. So if you have questions or comments, please feel free to unmute yourself to ask a question or to provide commentary. This presentation is being recorded and it will be available for replay. And so with that, I am pleased to bring you this week's deep dive on the role of sugar and disease. And to kick things off, um, I'd love to start off just brief agenda. We're talk about, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about just some history, just to set sort of the stage for the conversation. And then we're going to have some really interesting conversations with, with our experts who are on the line. And for each of those, it'd be wonderful if we could just get a, a really brief uh, introduction on each of your backgrounds. If we could start with, uh, with Bo Ances and then go with Colin Champ and then finally Jim McCarter before we jump into the presentation. That would be excellent. So... I'm Bo Ansis. I'm a neurologist here at Washington University in St. Louis. I do a lot of research in Alzheimer's disease, in particular in developing neuroimaging biomarkers to make an earlier diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Thanks, Bo. Colin? Hey, Colin Champ, Associate Professor at Duke, radiation oncologist and integrative medicine practitioner. I treat mostly breast cancer and lymphoma, but my research is centered on dietary and exercise uh, modification to both prevent cancer and improve uh, treatment outcomes and overall health outcomes during survivorship. Excellent. And uh, Jim? Sure. Can you hear me all right? We can. Okay. Yeah. So uh, Jim McCarter and background MD and PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, where I remain an adjunct professor of genetics, but I've spent the last 20 years in industry, first in biotech startups in the area of infectious disease, parasitology, and genomics, then corporate venture capital, returning to the startup area with Verta Health, and then most recently now with Abbott Diabetes Care. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. Well, and then what I just quick disclaimer, just would like to make a note that you know, all the views expressed by the speakers here may not necessarily reflect that of their organizations and they're here as our guests, as individuals, and just want to make that, that clear. So let's just go ahead and jump in. I'm going to talk for maybe five, 10 minutes just to set the stage, and then I'm going to shut up and let some of uh, our speakers talk about some of the work and some of their perspectives on, on the work that they're doing and how sugar and disease affects the areas that they're, that they're focused on. But uh, I want to sort of set the stage here that it's important that we talk we, to make a distinction about the types of sugars that we're talking about here today, which is principally sh simple sugars in the way that they've become so pervasive in our food system today. There'll be some discussion today around no carb or low carb uh, diets, which may also include complex sugars in those in those contexts. 
But these simple sugars shown here are principally mono and disaccharides, which are converted to glucose in the body. These sugars will dominate the discussion today, particularly in the context of sugar and food, which are glucose, uh, sucrose, and fructose. I also wanna make the distinction uh, here that as we move through the conversation, sugar consumption is a very important aspect in the development and progression of disease. It's not the only factor, but just sort of wanna set that piece here um, that principally going forward, we're, we're talking about the, particularly the prevalence of glucose, sucrose, and fructose in the food system today due to its uh, extreme absorbil absorbability in the body, and then some of the structural components that have made it are really fundamentally useful beyond the fact that it's caused an epidemic in some of the processed foods that we, uh, that we consume today. So to sort of set some historical precedent here, you know, there, there are two things fundamentally that I would consider to be true, is one, that humans have always really intensely loved and craved sugar, and two, that we used to really not that ha have that much of it, or at least it was really not that accessible, Again, sugar was once only a luxury afforded to the wealthy, where the first evidence of diabetes and type 2 diabetes and obesity first emerged when some of these upper class um, groups sort of across a wide variety of societies. And in the time, it was really viewed as a disease of the affluent, but sugar was really rarely uh, pointed to as a culprit in the development of those diseases. In fact, sugar has been seen numerous ways over the course of history. Uh, for the majority of human history, it's actually been seen as, as something that's generally healthy or at least not as bad as the other components in our foods. Both the evolution of science and the incredibly powerful sugar and food and beverage industries have sort of certainly influenced these views around sugar and the delay and sort of our understanding of the impact that it has had. But with the development of, of sugar refinery technologies, industrial scale agriculture, and, and the exploitation of people, it's been possible to scale sugar production into the massive industry and the widely available product that it is today. You now, in fact, in the, since the 13th century, between the 13th century and the 20th century, the cost of sugar fell 180 times. And as it became much more widely available, it became much more widely consumed. You know, in addition to the sweetness that is so inherently pleasurable to humans, it, it has desirable properties that make it an, an incredible addition to processed foods notably structural properties and preservative properties. And as such, the consumption has exploded, particularly in the last 200 to 300 years. For example, the yearly amount of sugar consumed per capita in England quadrupled in the 18th century and again in the 19th century. And in the US, consumption increased 16 times in the 19th century alone. And as you can see in this chart here between 1900 and 1910 and, and 2010, at least doubled, at least in the terms of the total amount of sugar that was available for consumption over the course of those hundred years. And just really magnitudes of an increase in our ability to consume something that, you know, while energy is obviously fundamental and core to, to the functioning of our biology, just the simple availability of it. And so with the advent of processed foods and the inclusion of sugar into so much of what you might see on the shelves in the supermarket, even things that you wouldn't expect to need refined sugar or have refined sugar. I always think of bread, particularly in this instance, as something that has certainly changed a lot over the last few hundred years. You know, and many of us are well aware of the impacts that sugar now has on chronic disease, principally cardio and metabolic diseases like type two diabetes, obesity, and heart disease, uh, but not limited to emerging areas like oncology and neurology. So when I think about, you know, just sort of setting a simple precedent for why this has caused, why sugar has caused such a large problem in our health and how we've come to understand that. One of our, one of our uh, guests in the audience turned me on to this idea that basically, you know, over the last couple hundred years, we've really grown accustomed to, to, to eating an equivalent kind of to rocket fuel and that the amount of energy that is available in food to be quickly and easily metabolized so frequently and so availably is just at an order of magnitude scale that has never been possible in, in human history before to so many people and essentially causes a really a major energy imbalance that causes some major malfunctions in the body, which can include the inability to produce insulin, which can include insulin resistance, which can include the storage of fat in the liver and fatty liver disease, the storage of visceral fat on the body that have led to health complications for so many millions of Americans and, and people worldwide. And so while that may not be news to many of us, it's important to restate how diet-related disease largely implicated over the consumption of sugar or by the consumption of sugar 
have caused a chronic disease epidemic in the U.S. worldwide. You can see just two charts that show sort of the increase in obesity in America, as well as the staggering costs of diabetes and the rise of principally type 2 diabetes, which makes up around 90%, um, if not more, of, of all diabetes cases. Some other statistics that just, just help sort of paint the picture, uh, the World Health Organization reports that obesity rates have doubled worldwide since 1980. In 2014, more than half a billion adults on the planet were obese. Um, and more than 40 million children under the age of five were overweight or obese. Six in every uh, 10 lower limb amputations um, in adults are due to diabetes, some 73,000 of them in 2010 alone. And, and the latest estimates are that 11.6% of the adult population in China is epidemic, one in nine, uh, more than 110 million Chinese individuals in total, and almost half a billion Chinese. This was a number that kind of blew my mind are believed to be pre-diabetic and at risk of developing diabetes. And so just to, it, it's, it's pretty incredible the scale of which the increase in sugar in our food and the availability of this rocket fuel type of food has led to and, and been a key, a key part of the development of some of these um, major chronic disease epidemics um, in the country. And so here we, we talk about ones that are more commonly associated with with sugar consumption, diabetes, and obesity. Others may include other cardiometabolic diseases, fatty liver disease, heart disease, et cetera. But there's a lot of really interesting research that is starting to implicate sugar and its role either through those forms, so through the causation of obesity, through the causation of type 2 diabetes, into some other diseases, or that it may have some standalone effects on its own, even in the absence of patients who have already developed diabetes, obesity, or some of these other major diet-related chronic diseases. And so with that, I'd like to sort of jump into this next portion of our presentation, which is really thinking about three key disease areas. We're going to start with, the order down here is incorrect, but we're going to start with uh, uh, oncology, and then we're going to move into metabolic disease, and then we're going to go into uh, neurology. And to kick things off, we have Colin Champ with us to talk about some of his work in oncology. I'm just going to set the stage here briefly is that there's sort of, at least in the, in the, what I've read and, and Colin can correct me here is that in terms of sugar's role in oncology, I sort of seen it from two, two perspectives. One is that the reduction or restriction of carbohydrate and sugar intake um, can play a role in the improvement of patients in terms of their treatment and normal treatment protocols, and also has been shown in some cases to suggest that sugars could play a role in cancer with or without the presence of obesity. But I'm gonna go ahead and start asking Colin some questions. And Colin, we're really excited to hear more about you and about the work that you're doing, some of your perspectives here on nutritional interventions, sugar and carbohydrates and the role that they play in oncology. And I kinda of wanna start off with a question here that, you know, I'm just wondering, can you tell us a little bit about how nutrition is or or isn't included in cancer treatment protocols today? And is there strong evidence that supports and shows that nutrition is a key determinant of outcomes for, for cancer patients? And, and how has the data and the perception supporting nutritional interventions in oncology sort of changed over the last you know, 10 years or so? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's uh, the, the, the quick and easy answer is that, that there, there really aren't nutritional protocols per se, especially trying to impact outcomes there, there are, you know, most cancer centers have, have nutritionists, have handouts, et cetera, but these pretty much mirror the, the general kind of low fat calorie restriction, somewhat antiquated guidelines. We, we looked at them 10 years ago and only four of the 22 NCCN cancer centers even made dietary recommendations and half of them were just basically don't lose weight, which is, we, we know from old studies that cancer patients that lose weight generally do worse. And then half of them were low fat, kind of the, the Harvard, New England, cardiac prudent type diet recommendations. Nowadays, there are more places making dietary recommendations, but again, they're kind of the same. They're, they're beating the same, old, the same old drum. There are studies like, like mine, looking at intermittent fasting, looking at ketogenic diets, looking at carbohydrate restriction, some to help with weight loss, extrapolating from a lot of the data in the weight loss world, like Jeff Volokh studies, et cetera. And then a lot trying to see if it will actually improve 
cancer specific outcomes and cancer specific treatments like radiation. And so just for anybody who's not aware of sort of what a ketogenic diet is, could you explain a little bit about what that means and, and why that might be something of interest for, for patients undergoing cancer, cancer treatment? Sure. So very generally speaking, it's, it's, it's often viewed as a low carb diet, but it's basically a diet with, with carbohydrates and protein sufficiently low that it causes the liver uh, to start producing ketones, which are these energy sources that can cross the blood brain barrier. And they're also muscle, they also help to preserve muscle. So from a cancer point of view, there's, there's a couple points there that are important. You know, your number one point there, low muscle mass is associated with worse outcomes. So we want to be able to preserve muscle mass. So one, there's some, some data that shows that cancer cells actually secrete inflammatory hormones that, that inhibit hepatic ketogenesis. So giving, causing ketogenesis may actually improve muscle mass. Ketones may sensitize cancer cells to radiation. That's strictly from animal studies. We, we've not run these studies in humans due to a lot of barriers with implementing the diet. And that's a, a whole other conversation that we can discuss. <laughs> and then the low, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is that it, no, no pun intended, the lowest hanging fruit is that it, the, the reduction of carbohydrates can reduce blood glucose levels, which correlate with worth, worth, worse outcomes in cancer but they can also decrease insulin levels. And that's an anabolic hormone that we know generally across the board negatively impacts outcomes after treatment for cancer cells. It fuels cancer cells. So it's kind of a, a, a one, one not a, it's a multi-trick pony. You, you change one thing and it may actually improve multiple outcomes across the board for cancer patients. We're just, we're, we're not necessarily looking at the we're not, we're not testing all of these again, due, due to issues uh, in terms of implementing the diet. Got it. And are, 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 are patients asking for, for treatments like this? Cause I, I can imagine the patients are probably super, super engaged and that maybe the, the challenges in terms of getting better longitudinal data and research around this is more at the, at the research level than it, I, I imagine the patients are probably excited about opportunities and things like this. Y yeah. The, uh... You know, our, our first study that we published, it was only seven patients, but they were getting chemo and radiation. Uh, and this was when I was in Philadelphia. And these were patients that actually were coming from all over the place uh, to go on this diet at, with their treatment because they knew we, we'd published a, an animal study on it. And uh, I did a couple podcasts talking about it. And so all of a sudden, all these patients started coming from afar. It was ironic because at the time I was submitting for grants to test the study and to be funded to test the study. And they were all uniformly getting rejected. And the responses were, you're, you're out of your mind. We're not going to be able to put cancer patients on the study. So you have the, the academic world saying that. And then you have kind of the real life world showing up at our doorstep saying, we're going to come there for treatment just so you can watch us go on this diet. Right. Uh, right. And, and so that was the first paper we, we published on it. It was very labor intensive. We were pricking these uh, patients' fingers all the time. We were sending them for labs to check ketone levels. So it was very, it was a, a cumbersome study. But what it did show is uh, the, these patients were getting high doses of Decadron, which, which spikes your blood sugar through the roof, which during cancer treatment means you have to be put on insulin. And it, it's just a whole mess, especially when you're getting chemotherapy and radiation. Mm -hmm. So we showed that if you simply just put them on this diet, even on high dose steroids, their blood sugar stayed in the 80s. Wow. So it was kind of a, yeah, it was our way of we have high hopes for it. This is kind of a low hanging fruit, but we said, Hey, look, it's safe. And you don't have to put these patients on insulin anymore. And, and since, you know, the, unfortunately there's, there's a lot of re review articles, but the, the research world hasn't pushed ahead that much in terms of implementing the diet during, during cancer treatment. Well, and what, what do we know about the, the biology and the mechanism of understanding, you know, how excess glucose in blood or serum would have a role in the progression of, of cancer. Is that, are there theories around that? Is it well understood? Is there more work that needs to be done to understand that? I mean, the, the visual, a good visual way is just to look at a, a PET scan. So you have radio labeled glucose, you give it to someone and the cancer cells eat it up and it, it lights up like a Christmas tree. So you know, that, that doesn't mean, so, so we know that the cancer cells are metabolically very active. We know that they love to, to take in glucose. We know that they love insulin because insulin allows them to take in further glucose. Conversely, you know, we can't say that if you, if you cut it out of the diet, it's going to magically make the cancer cells go away. 
but we do know in multiple different sites like breast cancer, we do know in brain tumors, glioblastomas, that you can pretty much track someone's glucose and how high it is correlates inversely with how their survival is going to be. Um, yeah. there, there, there could be multiple um, mechanisms by which this happens. But again, we, we know that, that the more sugars around, the more metabolically active these cancer cells are going to be, the more insulin that's around, the more anabolic their growth is going to be. And there's, there's definitely plenty of studies trying to block insulin uptake with, with drugs but we may be able to do it through diet. Got it. As you, as you start to think about, you know, the future of this maybe being included more formally in, in patient treatment protocols, what do you sort of view as like, is there, is there a landmark study that needs to be done or is there, is, are there places that it's being implemented more clearly or sort of what's like the, the burden of, of evidence or the threshold to get more people in the medical community interested and, and sort of viewing that this is really an evidence-based solution to helping improve outcomes for patients. So yeah, that's, there's a, the low hanging fruit is that we, we know that it can reduce adipose tissue. We know that it can reduce diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. And we know that all those correlate with cancer specific outcomes, but we know they correlate with general health outcomes. Mm-hmm. So really in the cancer world now, we're not just saying, how's your you know, breast cancer specific outcome? We're saying, how's your general overall health? So we know that it can improve that. And so because of that, more and more people are doing it. At Duke, we have the, a diet and fitness center that's run by Will Yancey, where we can send patients to, and he specifically puts them on a ketogenic diet or even a low carbohydrate diet mm-hmm. just to improve with their weight. So that's kind of the low hanging fruit. The, the bigger leap of faith is, can it actually improve outcomes? And the, the issue there is that that requires a large study and it requires a lot of people to be on the diet. And I see here that, that Bob messaged about Memorial Sloan Kettering and MD Anderson are doing clinical trials. And there are a bunch of places doing clinical trials. Actually, uh, a couple guys that were at WashU, I think they're at Iowa now, did a couple studies, but they gave people keto cal, which, which is like liquid gruel. So if you're a cancer patient going through treatment, it's not going to work out. And it, it didn't work out because of that. So really the, the issue has been A, getting people on the diet and then B, measuring to make sure that they're actually on the diet. And then we once we can successfully do that, then we can test to see whether it has an outcome or not. But right now you have people that I saw, I reviewed a study for this journal where it was a quote ketogenic diet, but they never tested ketones. They were eating about 100 grams of carbs a day and about 80 grams of protein a day. So it was not a a ketogenic diet at all. So we see a lot of that. So we need to be able to measure it. And then we need to be able to measure the outcomes. And I think once we can do that, we'll have a good picture as to whether it works in terms of cancer specific outcomes. Got it. There are a couple of questions in the audience, actually. And then I'll let you, then I'll let you run back to clinic because I know you've got, I know you've got a lot of things going on in the background. Ed Rogers, who's the CEO of a company called Bonumos, which is a producer of rare sugars like tagatose, iolose, and allose, was curious to know if that was something that had come up in any of your research or if that's something that you guys are interested in, in learning more about. Excuse me. In a clinical setting, I haven't seen those being tested. You know, kind of like a lot of what I'm discussing, it's, you know, it's all in the preclinical world. So, you know, I'm sure I or others would love, love to test that. So yeah, I would love to chat a little more about that offline. Got it. Well, Colin, before, before you jump, is there anything else you're working on that we should know about things you're excited about that would be good for anybody in the audience to be following over the next couple of years? Sure. Yeah. We're, we're looking at actually low carb and intermittent fasting, attempting to go through basically periodic ketosis to see if that would improve outcomes. So that's a study we have going on here at Duke. And then simultaneously, we're sending patients, well, pre-COVID, we were sending patients to undergo intense exercise, heavy exercise regimens with really the goals to build muscle and to reduce adipose tissue and kind of hit those metabolic outcomes on both ends. Excellent. Well, really excited to learn more about about some of that work going forward. And and Colin, really appreciate you taking the time to share share your insights with us today and enjoy the clinic. and, And thanks again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. And uh, if anyone has any questions, you know, feel free to ping me anytime. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks.
All right. Well, thank you everyone for your, for your comments and questions thus far. We're going to jump to the next portion here, which is really focused around metabolic diseases, which where we understand certainly more about the role that sugar plays. And we have Jim McCarter here to talk to us about a lot of the really exciting and fairly groundbreaking work. And he gave me a lot of homework to do over the weekend and got to read some really exciting stuff about the world of, of continuous glucose monitoring and, and nutritional interventions. And so, uh, Jim, I'm going to kick things off here just with some questions, just to sort of sure. set this up with your background and how it might play a role in sort of our understanding of sugar's role in diabetes and treatment going forward. So you've, you've seen a lot in terms of the growth in the use of dietary interventions and protocols for type two diabetes and metabolic syndrome. You know, can you start by telling us a little bit about your time at, at Verda and, and what you and the team were able to do there with non-invasive, this non-invasive tech enabled platform to drive dietary changes that really, you know, reversed type two diabetes in a lot of patients. And how is, how is sort of the thinking around those types of inter interventions maybe evolved since then and now? Sure. Well, thank you, David, for the opportunity and thanks everyone. I'd start off before I get into the, the Verda example, sure. just by saying that, you know, to kind of add to your comments from the introduction is that not only has sugar been increased in our diet and added to many processed foods, but at the same time, really in the eighties, the push into this low fat paradigm, uh, fat was being removed from the diet so that when you remove fat and increase sugar, you actually reduce satiety. So you stay hungry and you increase cravings because sugar is known to, you know, in, in increase people's craving for food. And so that overall leads to, you know, increase, you know, number of meals per day, snacking and just total, you know, calorie consumption in, in increases. So, but regardless of how we got where we are in terms of this problem, this epidemic of obesity and diabetes, the work that we've done with, with Verda is to show, like Colin was saying, with ketogenic diets and cancer, we have a lot of data now. The ability to use ketogenic diets as a tool to reverse uh, type 2 diabetes. Yeah, so I, I joined Verda in, in 2015 as the sixth outside hire. I was there for four years. I headed clinical operations, hired our health coaches and physicians, and, and led the research team through a recruitment and beginning of a, of a five-year, 500-person clinical trial in partnership with Indiana University Health. And, and so, you know, kind of what did Verda deliver? First was continuous remote care. So before we even get into the nutrition component of the intervention, this was to kind of move people from the paradigm of coming in in person to see your physician once, twice, three times a year where message is lost and lack of continuity to one where you basically have a health coach and a physician at your fingertips 24 seven and that they are synchronized in terms of their, their messaging. So you don't have cognitive dissonance between the physician telling you one thing and the health coach telling you another. So that, and leverage technology and, and an app on a smartphone, you know, machine learning behind the scenes so that care can be delivered seamlessly. So that's kind of the bells and whistles of actual you know, care delivery that, that Verda accomplished. But then the, the nutritional intervention, we, there was data suggesting in small trials that the use of a ketogenic diet where you reduce uh, carbohydrates to less than 30 grams a day with moderate amount of protein can actually be very effective at reversing type two diabetes. And that's what we showed in this, in this large clinical trial is that in the majority of our patients, we were able to uh, reverse their disease. And had there, was, there, was there evidence prior to this and, and, and precedent studies of this? Because the, the one thing that was really impressive to me was just the size and the scale of the study itself and just how strong the results were compared to some, you know, to, to other things that I had read. And so was, was, there, was there a good precedent for this before that? Yeah, there were small clinical trials, including some out of Duke. And, you know, with a couple dozen people, there was a small study out of UCSF. And, but what we really tried to do was to scale this. So we had 262 people with type 2 diabetes in the intervention arm, another 116 with prediabetes, and then 87 in a control arm. And to really show that we could deliver this outcome at scale. Got it. 
And just to just to clarify, so 53.5% saw a reversal in diabetes. Can you just clarify just for the audience what what, what reversal of diabetes means, you know, just to make a distinction between reversal and remission? Sure. Yeah. And, and I would say that the, you know, the take home from the study, which is now we've published 10 papers, including one and two year diabetes outcomes, we're collecting data for uh, three and a half year outcomes that'll get published uh, eventually collect the folks at Verta will collect the data for the five year outcomes of the study. And, and the kind of big take home points are that the hemoglobin A1C drops 1.3%. On, on the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. Insulin use is reduced 94%. Huge reduction, not only in insulin, but in all diabetes medication use. Weight loss averages of 12%, reversal of cardiovascular disease. And then I'll get into the diabetes reversal, that those folks that met our definition of diabetes reversal, meaning that their hemoglobin A1C was less than 6.5%, without the use of any diabetes medication other than metformin, which we generally can wow. continue to use even in folks that are pre-diabetic, they have the option of remaining on metformin. Remission is a more formal definition where you basically say, okay, no medication use at all. But even the folks that didn't meet that definition still did very well with you know, big drops in, in insulin use, big drops in 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 their a1c and their and their and their weight so it's not as if half the people are failing right right so you know a lot of a lot of what we talked about so far has really been around you know people who have already developed metabolic diseases cardiometabolic diseases because of not not only because of sugar but as sugar has a large you know role to play here mm -hmm. But, you know, one thing that you and I talked a little bit about was just the general engagement that consumers and that there are companies now that are promoting metabolic health tools for people that may be one quite healthy or just simply may not have diabetes, prediabetes, anything in that world. So with like the, you know, availability of, of tools like continuous glucose monitoring and some of these tools are evolving to help people understand their own metabolic health. Do you think that has implications around sort of the engagement that people in general have with their metabolic health and, and could that have an impact on the sort of rates at which people are developing the disease so that we get to a point where we're really in more of a preventative phase as opposed to sure. a reactionary phase? Yeah, and, and maybe I'll start by kind of the broader context of, you know, Jerry Reavens in the 1980s at Stanford laid out this context of syndrome X or metabolic syndrome that all of these components kind of travel together. It's not only diabetes or, or poor you know, hyperglycemia, uh, it's, it's also dyslipidemia, it, it's also hypertension, all of, the, all of these factors kind of travel together. And, and so what a ketogenic diet does or carbohydrate restriction in general does is to reverse insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. And that gets this benefit, this metabolic benefit across the board. So it's not only diabetes that's improved, it's also reduction in hypertension, it's resolution of dyslipidemia with reduced triglycerides, improved uh, triglyceride to HDL ratio, and reduction in inflammation. So beta-hydroxybutyrate, the ketone, is an inhibitor of the NLRP3 inflammasome, so you get reduction in inflammation. Verta has an abstract they've published showing that if you look at 16 different inflammatory biomarkers, including IL-6 and C-reactive protein, that 12 out of the 16, so statistically significant reduction in that cohort that we followed at Indiana University Health. So, you know, broad, you know, kind of mechanistic understanding of kind of how this is happening with insulin being, uh, you know, a key factor. And I would say in terms of the broader opportunity for metabolic gain is that something like 83% of the U.S. adult population has a degree of metabolic dysfunction. And nearly half have either type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. So it's really a broad set of people that have the opportunity to benefit. Very few people kind of have ideal metabolic health, even though the U.S. dietary guidelines only will consider healthy people in their, their studies. <laughs> so, so I think there's, yeah, there's the opportunity, and we can maybe talk a little bit about, you know, continuous glucose monitoring and other tools. But yeah, I think there's the opportunity to not only help people that have established disease like two type, two, type 2 diabetes, but help the broader public. Yeah, well, maybe maybe that maybe that is a good a good segue. So I mean, there's 
you're you're obviously very attuned to the world of continuous glucose monitoring given given your current role and given some of the work that you did at Verda in the past but sort of what is what are some of the tools like that that maybe you're excited about or any of the I guess and sort of maybe how that ties into further research and, and business models that might put us in a position to implement real-time monitoring and nutritional interventions at scale? Yeah, so I think the, the power of continuous glucose monitoring and other continuous monitoring tools is that you give patients real-time feedback. And it's impressive what people can do on their own, even without having a physician and a health coach to guide them, especially if they have less severe disease, is that and Abbott has now published studies you know, showing that in type 2 diabetes with people that aren't, are not even taking insulin yet, that they will get reduction in their hemoglobin A1C just by providing them with a continuous glucose monitor. They're able to kind of figure out some of this on their own. They're able to see the spikes. They're able to say, oh, okay, what did I have in that last meal that you know, may, have, may have caused that, that spike and, and, and react. And so what our team at the New Analyte Ventures Group at Abbott Diabetes Care is doing, and there, I can't say a lot about it yet because we've got a lot of things kind of in the pipeline that we haven't yet announced publicly, but we are doing a couple of things. One is expanding the use of continuous glucose monitoring beyond diabetes, which is our current label in the United States. We've introduced a product uh, called LibreSense in Europe, which allows for continuous glucose monitoring in healthy individuals for athletics and sports and, and wellness in general. And, you know, kind of working on bringing that to market, not only in eight European countries, but more widely internationally. And then we have a pipeline of, of additional analytes that we can measure continuously. Haven't yet disclosed what those are, but those are, you know, stay tuned in the coming year. Well, I will, I will choose not, choose not to pry at this time <laughs> for, uh, for any, any, any more depth there. Well, I'd like to I'd like to pause here to see if there's any if there's any questions from the audience for Jim please feel please feel free to to type those in either the chat box or the Q and A and I can I can answer as as they arrive or, or as appropriate. But Jim, any any final thoughts or or things that you'd like to leave us with, just in terms of you know things that you're excited about going forward, and and maybe any any new research or any new offerings that we sure. should. Do? That we should be aware yeah, of. A, a, a couple things. One related to Verda, I would say, is that we have a couple papers that are in, in the pipeline. Look for one coming out pretty soon, which is our two-year cardiovascular outcomes. The one-year cardiovascular outcomes that we have already published in cardiovascular diabetology in 2019 were using NMR lipo profile to look at the particles, the different particles lipid particles. And we have a new publication with Ron Krauss using ion mobility. That'll be the two-year cardiovascular outcomes. And then jumping back to Colin's presentation on cancer, the one thing that I would add to what he said is interesting startup Faith Therapeutics, including Lou Cantley and colleagues at Cornell, combining ketogenic diets with PI3 kinase inhibitors. And so, you know, so for you know, investors that may be, you know, kind of an interesting thing to kind of keep an eye on. Excellent. Thanks, Jim. We do have, we do have one question here from the audience. Does any, any thoughts on the app-based personal feedback type products and their role in behavior modification? Obviously you've seen some, you have some exposure to those, but any just general thoughts there? Yeah. I mean, it, there's, if you look at kind of, you know, apps that are in the kind of health and wellness court category, there are are, I don't know how many, many, many thousands of them. I, I would say that one thing that they, I would two critiques. One would be over-reliance on quantified self metrics that are less valuable or don't matter as much. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's only so much you can get um, out of, you know, measuring steps is nice, but it's not like measuring, you, you know, glucose in your blood. It's a less valuable marker of, of, of health. And then the second is over-reliance on psychology without physiology. And so while psychology is important in terms of behavior change, and it's definitely an important part of what the Verta team does, it has to mesh with, with the physiology. If you're fighting insulin resistance and have sky high insulin every day, there's only so much you can do in, in terms of the psychology of behavior change. Uh -huh. And Mike Kahn, I noticed you raised your hand. I, I, I promoted you to a panelist. Did you have a question?
perhaps I'm mistaken. I'm trying to manage too many webinar oriented tasks here at once. Well, uh, thanks David for the opportunity. Yeah, Jim, thank you so much. Really fantastic, exciting work. Really appreciate sharing your time with us and uh, look forward to chatting more. So with that, let's talk about the brain. Um, really excited to have Bo Ansis here. I'm going to set the stage here just briefly. You know, we've worked with Bo on, you know, really just trying to think about and work on our Alzheimer's disease thesis and understanding of this disease where there's not always a ton of, of understanding. But as we've sort of looked more and more at the world of the impacts of sugar on disease, you know, neurological conditions like uh, Alzheimer's have certainly come up. Just some interesting factoids here. You know, numerous studies have shown that, you know, excess blood glucose has been associated with decreases in cognitive function. And some studies have shown that patients with type 2 diabetes have a two, two times higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease and dementia. In some cases, Alzheimer's has been referred to as type 3 diabetes, with some of these theories pointing to insulin resistance as a potential reason that the body may not be able to remove um, plaques from the brain. Some other theories are really more about delivery of essentially shrinking, the shrinking of blood vessels and um, the inability to, to take blood and nutrients to cells in the brain. But to talk about this a little bit more, I'm excited to get some of Bo's thoughts. You know, Bo, as we talked about in the past, the, the causes of Alzheimer's and, and other forms of neurodegeneration are still somewhat of a mystery and have stumped a lot of the therapeutic efforts thus far. But given some of the work that has come out and it's sort of associating sugar consumption with cognitive decline, has that shown up at all in sort of the way that patients are being treated today or any thinking around the way patients with Alzheimer's or other neurodegeneration are being treated today? Yes, yeah, so, so David, thank you so much for inviting me. And it's really uh, a pleasure to be a part of such a, a magnificent panel and great questions already this morning. We need to step back a second. So it's been very interesting. You've been hearing about diabetes control. You've been hearing about oncology. What's very interesting in the brain is, is that the brain has no reserves of glucose. So it is deeply dependent upon sugar, meaning that it needs it for its energy to actually have the brain cells functioning. So you have this yin and yang kind of relationship. It needs enough energy so that it's working well, but then as you've been hearing, and David is so nicely and eloquently, and Jim has already presented the whole history of that we have too much now sugars being often added to many of our, into our diet, that you have actually this excess. And so this balance plays a key role in, in, in the brain. And for those brain cells or neurons, for them to function, they need to have an energy supply. And so they're highly dependent upon that. It has also come to our attention. And when I see any kind of patient that's coming to me in the clinic, they don't just, and you also heard this from Jen, is that one day they don't just have Alzheimer's disease and the day before they did it, it's a slowly progressive process. And the same kinds of things that we're looking at and making these early diagnoses to cure with pre-diabetes is we're trying to make these preclinical diagnoses of individuals with Alzheimer's disease. Often though, when we see individuals as they get older, we start to realize that they don't read the textbook, meaning that they do have Alzheimer's disease, but they also have vascular issues that are also going on. And when we try to separate those kinds of factors, it's very, very hard. And so when we look at pathology, we often see that they have changes in those blood vessels. They have these brain cells that are dying that are due, due to Alzheimer's disease, but they also have these vascular risk factors. And so there has been a large push much more recently of how do we have modifiable risk factors? Because as David brought out just in this most recent intro, we have not had a good drug, even though the FDA almost approved one of these drugs about a month ago for Alzheimer's disease. The last drug that was approved was over 17 years ago. And so when I'm seeing patients in the clinic, the question is, are there other ways to modify and help treat that. And so if there are modifiable risk factors, as you heard, as Jim was saying, if we have ability to monitor these individuals in a better way, can that make a difference in these individuals? And then the last point I would say is, is that you also heard this whole mention of ketones and, ketone and ketogenic diet. 
we actually do provide, and actually that is a form of treatment for some neurological conditions, in particular for epilepsy. And so it is actually now being considered in individuals with Alzheimer's disease. And there are ketogenic diets that are looking at providing more ketone bodies, so providing enough energy, but allowing the neurons as brain cells to use it, but not having too much of this. And so what you're trying, what we're starting to see is, is that there is a clear link between Alzheimer's disease, sugar or metabolism, uh, glucose metabolism, and then its consequences, which are often inflammation. Got it. That's really, that's super helpful, interesting context, Bo. And it kind of, it reminds me of a conversation that we've had in, you know, over the last year, year and a half with you on a, on a number of, you know, calls and reviews that we've done is, you know, it, it seems like in the future, we may be in a world where there are different types of Alzheimer's that occur and they may, maybe they manifest themselves with similar uh, symptoms by the end, but they may have fundamental different causes or reasons that they come to be. Is this, is the thinking around the impacts of metabolic health and sort of how this ties into patients who may have other conditions like type 2 diabetes, obesity, et cetera, be a type of, does, does that influence the thinking that there may be different types of Alzheimer's disease um, out there? Well, uh, that's a great question. It, it, so we are right now at a crossroads with Alzheimer's disease. Um, Many of you have seen and have seen in the literature, there has been this idea that something called the amyloid hypothesis. So there's this idea that amyloid generates, and then that leads to other kinds of changes. Now, there have been a number of numerous therapies that have been uh, specifically targeting anti-amyloid agents. And what we've seen is that so far, a lot of those therapies have not worked or have been have had limited applicability. And so now individuals are thinking about, are there other avenues to actually look at besides just the amyloid for treatments for Alzheimer's disease? And so that's why this becomes very important. So there are now anti-tau agents, there are now anti-inflammation agents, mm -hmm. and then there are also other anti-metabolic, and we have very good treatments and Jim and others have done really those pioneering work of kind of saying, how do we have better glucose control? And so the question is, can we use and implement those kinds of me mechanisms that could also modify, say, amyloid or tau? Now, what's very interesting in the field that's also that you're starting to see is, is that how this all, all relates to is that we heard about, and what I tell my patients is, you are what you eat. And so there has now even been these links between the gut microbiome and changes in the gut microbiome and how that influences what we see in the brain. And in fact, there are even now therapies that are affecting the gut that we're trying to regulate what is absorbed from the gut. And that may lead to reductions in amyloid within the brain. And so there's actually a study in China that is now being done here in the United States that are looking at seaweed and seeing how that affects other factors and how that leads to changes in amyloid. So you can quickly see that con tighter control of what we eat and of the metabolites of what we are feeding ourselves could have an impact on what's happening in our brain. God, it's a lot of, it, it, when, when you think about all of those factors like coming together, I mean, you know, if you think sort of the next 10, 20 years, is, is there, are there any fundamental understandings around the role that the diet, nutrition, sugar intake, et cetera, will play in roles? Do you think we'll have a, a more definitive understanding of, of the role that they play? While we have some of the data available now, you know, are there any, you know, big studies like the one you just mentioned that you think are going to help give us a better sense of that more deterministically? Yeah, I think there's going to be more. I think we're, we're already seeing a revolution. And I, 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 again, it's really a pleasure to be following some of the comments by other, other speakers that you heard. A lot more patients are now coming in with those Fitbits or other kinds of measures to kind of be tracking themselves. And I think that's only going to be a future way of evaluating individuals. And I am trying to promote with many of my individuals a more healthy lifestyle 
And that is very important, even in COVID times, especially even more important in COVID times to get people out moving about, be active, but also social distancing in those manners. But what I would say is, is that there needs to be more studies on looking at exercise interventions. There's been a number that have shown that they could be beneficial. Some, though, have shown not a lot, but it's very hard, as you heard about having exercise coaches, having everybody. So if there are other ways where individuals can have a more tighter or more stronger control and they can kind of be constantly monitoring themselves, that is going to be a wave of the future. What's so unique is that in the past, we've really had difficulties of looking at what's in the brain. So we've been always forced to either open you up or do what I do, take pictures of people's brains. Now, in contrast with looking at your blood sugars, we could easily just look at your blood and do a finger stick or do other ways to monitor individuals. We now have that ability and there are now techniques that are looking at the plasma of A, beta and tau. So looking at these hallmarks of what's happening in the brain, they spill out and they also are seen in the blood. And so we will now have abilities to kind of constantly monitor individuals. And so I think that kind of way of what's looking, what's happening in an individual will have a lot more feedback and that will be able to provide more kind of everyday kind of control of what's happening in those individuals. Yeah, gosh, it is. It must be just such an exciting time to be in a position where these tools are evolving and you can really just capture so much information on patients and individuals and, you know, for, especially for a disease category where it's been so hard to capture information and, and information that's considered meaningful over the last, you know, however many years. I, I absolutely, I absolutely think that's going to be the way because it's also going to reduce the number of visits that's going to be happening. And it, now we're having, we're doing this right now through telehealth. We're going to have all that information coming into us, and now we're going to be able to better kind of manage and see what's been happening. Because right now I'm just asking, how have you been the last six months? But if I have that input that's constantly coming into me, I can give you a better, oh, well, you know, the last two months, looking at your numbers on this, this, and this, from what you've been sending back to me, I now understand more of what's going on with you. Is there anybody who's is there anybody who's doing that well right now for neurological health? So in terms of at you as a you know as a as a physician a clinician like looking at the suite of tools that are out there for you to interface with patients, is there anything good that you've seen so far? No, I wish there were. I I, I don't know enough of this. I would love to work with others to do that. I just don't know of that. I, I have this kind of way of monitoring individuals and getting more of that feedback. It becomes a little bit of a very tricky line because how much information and what is being given is very, very important. And then what that kind of information, you already heard very eloquently from Jim of what some of those, there are limitations. So when you look at those Fitbits, and they give you the sleep, they're not really measuring sleep. They're just yeah. <laughs> measuring if you're not moving or if you are moving and doing that. They're not really giving you the quality or the stages of sleep. There are ways to do that. And we have done that here where we're monitoring the sleep activity in individuals. But that's a little bit more where you have to actually wear something or do something like that. So there, uh, but the wearables are really moving into mainstream. And I think that's going to be a wave of the future where we're going to be getting more input. We do that in epilepsy. We do that in individuals that are wearing monitors, or we do that in cardiology, but the kind of moving that to the everyday world, that's not yet there, but I could easily see that as a, as a wave of the future. Got it. Well, that's interesting that you mentioned the Fitbit piece here because a question from Mike uh, on our team just came in. It says, this is for both Bo and Jim, uh, if, you, if you have time and are able to answer. If you could design an Apple Watch that would help you monitor patients, what features would you want? And sort of what data would you ideally be able to collect in that perfect technology for you? Uh, I can start off. So yeah. I think you would want to get a sense of their, which is what we're doing now a little bit, not only with just Apple watches, but we're even doing this with cognition. And so to get little, little, very quick little bursts and see how you do 
on some of the cognitive performance and see how you're doing, because that's a much better test of how somebody's performing than when I bring you in and I sit in my white coat and then you get all scared and then I ask you to do pen and paper tests. <laughs> so it's a much more accurate reflection of the everyday of how an individual is doing to get simple questions of how a person's doing in their mood to do simple questions of or evaluations of their sleep, because we know that sleep is extremely important. This is that period of time where it kind of cleans out the whole system. It kind of flushes the stuff that's going on that's built up during the day. So getting those kinds of measures would be ideally, and that that could then be uploaded and be put into your, and I, I apologize ahead of time, it's just the system we use here, Epic system or whatever healthcare EHR, methods that you have that then could be that could then be quickly scrolled through so before i'm seeing you in my clinic i could see those metrics and get a kind of picture of what does david look like over the last four months right right that would be cool jim did you have did you have any thoughts on that yeah i, I would you know it's sort of my day job so i won't say <laughs> anything about the about the metabolic biomarkers but i, I will say that one of the unsolved things um, is how do you co collect data seamlessly and without uh, effort of, of what people are eating, caloric, comp, you know, macro calories, you know, uh, macronutrients, caloric consumption, you know, that's, I, I use the app Senza for that, but that's, you know, that's effort. So that's unsolved. And I'll jump back real quick, just to, in the last minute to add to what Bo was saying about you know, oftentimes the dependency of the brain on glucose is misinterpreted in a couple ways. So there's, you can go find a lot of, you know, authoritative websites that say that you must have sugar or carbohydrates in your diet and that you're dependent upon those. You're actually not in twofold. One is that the body, as you reduce carbohydrates, will keep your blood sugar normal with gluconeogenesis. There are plenty of substrates for making glucose. And unless you're taking high doses of insulin, you're not at risk of hypoglycemia. Also in, in fasting, ketones, which Colin mentioned across the blood-brain barrier, actually account for 60% of the brain's energetic needs actually come from, from the ketones. So, you know, there's both the, you know, both of those are metabolic substrates. Also lactate is a, is a metabolic substrate for the brain. So there are other sources of energy for the brain. And there is an exploration of ketogenic diets and delivery of ketones as an adjunct of therapy for Alzheimer's and other neurologic diseases. There's work going on at the Buck Institute uh, out in California, as well as Oxford University, looking at exogenous ketones. There are others that have looked at MCT oil as a way of ramping up ketones without having to fully change the diet in an elderly person. That's super interesting, Jim. And I, and I will second the piece that you mentioned about the authoritativeness of glucose needs in the brain, because I definitely came across on our websites over the last couple of weeks that, you know, was like that, yeah, extreme, very definitively stated that. So that's really helpful to sort of put that into context of other ways in which um, the brain can find energy. Um, sure. Well, seeing as we're at the top of the hour, Bo, I just like to ask if there's if there's anything that you're working on or things that you're excited on that you'd like to mention before we wrap things up here today. Yeah, I, I think we're very interested in two areas. We're looking at the gut microbiome very heavily, and we're now very interested in that. I think that there is a gut brain connection that needs to be investigated more in AD. And then the other area, we are looking at individuals that are at very high risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. And one of those areas that also these individuals also have metabolic abnormalities is Down syndrome. And so we know that individuals who have Down syndrome have trisomy 21, they have the amyloid, too much amyloid, and those individuals by the age of 40 will all have Alzheimer's disease and have the, the hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. And those metabolic, many of these individuals also have metabolic changes. And so we're very interested in those metabolic changes as well as the AD changes that are occurring in these individuals. Fantastic. Well, Bo, we certainly appreciate the excellent and super important work that you're working on and really appreciate you sharing your thoughts and insights on this topic and just sort of unpacking the complexities here because it's not 
you know, as much as we've titled this presentation that, you know, the role of sugar and disease, there's a role of a lot of other factors as well that are super interesting and super important. And so really appreciate you sort of helping us understand the, the bigger picture there. So I am just going to briefly wrap things up here just to provide sort of a summary of some of the things that, you know, I thought about in speaking with our experts prior to this call and some of the research that we did. There's been some really exciting work on the ability to show that diet can be a role, play a major role in reversing uh, diabetes, um, potentially other uh, metabolic and cardiometabolic disorders. We've shown that you know, nutritional protocols can improve patient, have the potential to, to, to improve patient outcomes in, in terms of both potentially preventing disease, but also in the course of treating disease can play a really interesting role. And finally, you know, just emphasizing that sugar has really become extremely pervasive in, in the food system today and something that we're all very well aware of but something that can be very hard to avoid, particularly when you go to the grocery store and, and things have refined sugar or new names or names that we don't understand that are, are really confusing. And it's really hard as a consumer, unless you're extremely educated on the subject to make decisions that you can be really confident in. And it does tie a little bit into some of these new methods in terms of measuring, you know, real-time glucose monitoring being something that the average person can eventually get a hold of as well as people who are pre-diabetic and diabetic as a way of trying to understand their health is a really interesting opportunity. One of the things that I feel like was one of the biggest takeaways from just reading through the, some of the research on neurology, oncology and metabolic disease in the consumption of sugar was that there just needs to be more in-depth longitudinal studies to really understand this sort of in-depth breakdown of, of the role that, that nutrition and sugar intake and carbohydrate intake can play in, in these in these disease categories. It was super impactful to me when I read that two-year Verta study. I was just so impressed by the results and by the thoroughness and the scale of the, of the study and seeing more work like that to sort of give confidence and understanding of the role that this can play was, is, is an exciting opportunity, but certainly something that needs resources in order for those things to happen. And then finally, sort of on, on remaining questions, I think, you know, one thing that I'm curious about is, is thinking about you know, going forward as nutrition makes its way more formally into, or sugar management makes its way more formally into the way that we manage disease, how do we know when it's going to have a big impact and when it may have a more minor impact and sort of taking it, how deterministic can we be in terms of understanding its mechanistic role in the progression and the development of disease? Uh, understanding sort of how, understanding some of this research and how important it is to control sugar and refined sugar intake, how can this be pushed forward more as a public health issue? And what are our ways that we can use policy to impact that? And I, I've been really excited and I'm really excited to try some of the tools like Levels Health that are out there for consumers who wanna get engaged with their metabolic health and learn more about sort of how their food really impacts blood glucose, et cetera. And I, and I think the, the importance and the emergence of those tools is yet unknown, but is a really exciting opportunity. And so I'd like to just take a moment here to pause and see if there are any questions or final comments from anybody either on the panel or from the audience before we tie things up today. I would just say, David, thank you for a very thorough, you know, introduction and great questions and, you know, just a very well prepared introduction to this topic. Much appreciated, Jim. Well, thank, thanks to you and, and thanks to Colin, who I believe had to drop off and, and thanks to Bo again for all of your insights and all the really honestly important work that you guys are doing. And thanks for taking a few minutes to share it with us this morning. For anybody who was new to today's uh, deep dive, we host these every two weeks, Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Central Time. Uh, these webinars are typically open to the public. Sometimes we sort of modify the general availability, but typically speaking going forward, you'll be uh, able to share this with other people. This recording will be, avail be available for replay. If you would like a copy of the slides um, or if you would like a copy of the, the literature review and research that was done prior to this call, I'm happy to share either of those with any who are interested. My, my email is dyocum at iselectfund.com, D-Y-O-C-O-M at iselectfund.com. Should you like to contact me with any requests for information or if you'd like to learn more about our speakers and the work that they're doing. Otherwise, thanks everyone for your time this morning and have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you. Thanks.